Hello beautiful stars, thanks so much for tuning in. I am a star and welcome to Source Light Star. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am very, very excited to have you here because today we are doing a very special reading because today we are collaborating with Linda from The Dark Alchemist. So in this reading, we are channeling the archetype of Aquarius, the water bearer. And the intention of this reading is basically to get to know the archetype of Aquarius so that we can align with this energy and also embody this energy. And the reason why I felt called from spirit to channel Aquarius, the water bearer, is also because today is the day where Pluto is finally moving into Aquarius and it's actually going to stay there until the year 2043. So it's actually a very, very long time. So this is obviously a timeless reading. Whenever this reading finds you, you are meant to hear this message today. Because basically what we are looking at in this reading is how to align with the energy of Aquarius. So in other words, how to align with the shift that's taking place, the shift in consciousness, the shift into the new earth, the great awakening, whatever we want to call it. The intention of this reading is to explore the archetype of Aquarius in order to help us understand how to align with this energy or how to embody this energy so that we can flow with the shifts and flow with the changes. And on Linda's side, they are basically looking at the shadow aspects. So how to integrate the shadow or let's say more the shadow side. So you find the link to Linda's video on the Dark Alchemist channel in my description box. All right, so let's look into our three main cards. Pile number one is the mountain. Pile number two is the one. And last but not least, pile number three is the tear. So see whichever pile, whichever energy draws you in. You find the timestamps in the description box. And I'm going to be seeing you in your reading. Hello, pile number one. So this is your reading if you have chosen the mountain. And we are channeling the archetype of Aquarius. And actually, the first thing that comes up, looking at the card, this is talking about the spiritual journey. So the archetype of Aquarius is actually resonating with the energy of the enlightened human. So this also very much resonates with the energy of Horus or Krishna or Jesus. So Christ consciousness, Krishna consciousness, crystal consciousness. That's oneness consciousness. And that's basically the top of the pyramid. That's the top of the mountain. And the archetype of Aquarius is basically the embodiment of that unity consciousness. And it is very interesting that the water bearer is actually called the water bearer because the water that the water bearer is holding in the vessel, in the pot, in the jug that is basically the water of the chaos ocean the water of unlimited potential it is really talking about again this notion of the pot the water bearer holding the water in the pot in the vase in the vessel this is actually a symbol of aquarius having the the infinite potential the infinite creative potential like holding the waters that can turn into anything. So this is really talking about our creative potential, but more than anything, our creative potential that comes as a result of being connected to the waters. So we are never really separate from the waters, the waters of noon, the chaos waters of the unconscious. And since part of our being is still connected to the ocean, still connected to this ocean of unlimited potentiality. That's why we are the water bearer. So it is very important to understand that all the 12 archetypes of the zodiac, 
they lie as a potential within ourselves. So we have the characteristics, the personality traits, the light aspect and the shadow aspect of all the 12 signs or the potential to embody all the 12 signs. But the purpose of these 12 signs is actually here to help us understand a specific aspect of Source Creator or a specific aspect of the universe or a specific aspect about ourselves. So the 12 archetypes of the Zodiac, they are actually helping us understand how we function, but also how the universe functions. And again, since the water bearer is talking about this notion of holding the water in the pot, this is basically a reminder that we are connected to this infinite pool of energy, this infinite ocean of energy. And it is also not by chance that the symbol for Aquarius is the zigzag, two zigzag waves. And this is actually the ancient Kemetic, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for water. But not water as in like actual water, water that we can drink. But it's talking about, again, this water of the infinite potential, like the ethereal waters or the chaos waters, the, the spirit waters, actually. And this wave hieroglyph is not only used to represent water, but also movement. It's movement, it's vibration, it's the wave form, basically. And we are connected to that wave form. Or in other words, it is through that wave form that we are connected to everything else in the universe. So the energy of Aquarius actually resonates, obviously, like the name says, with water, the water bearer, or also aqua. Aqua in Latin means water. But it obviously also resonates with air, because Aquarius is a sign with the element of air. But in order to understand why it is water and air, or in order to connect the two elements, we actually have to imagine that all the zodiac signs, they are a specific energy or a specific way how life force energy expresses itself. And the way life force energy expresses itself through Aquarius is actually this idea of the water droplets inside the air. So that's the way life force energy is Aquarian, like the Aquarian way of expressing life force energy is again these little droplets of water molecules that are swimming in the air. So it, that's the element of water, the water particle, but it's actually talking about the air, the air being the expansion, the air being the space. But again, through the water particles in the air, and the water particles are not only the moisture that we breathe, but the water particles also being these strings of spirit waves that connect us with the entire universe. So that's why Aquarius is talking about everything that has to do with networking, with the internet, with humanity, with everything that's global. It's actually a network. So the energy of Aquarius is like a network and this network is created through the merging of water and air that is creating this conductivity in the air, basically. Because water is the most conductive element of all. It holds vibration really well, and it also sound travels through water much easier than through air. So this notion of having the water particles in the air, it's actually this ability to connect to the entire network of the universe, like the entire spirit web through the water and that's why Aquarius is the water bearer because we have that water we hold that water that connects us to the rest of the universe through this network of spirit energy and that's why the archetype of Aquarius is actually talking about the enlightened human because when we have this water or when we are conscious about the fact that we hold that water that we hold that potential then we can actually start to embody our higher self. Then we can actually start this process of channeling the different aspects of who we are. 
channeling the information from the ethers, channeling extraterrestrials, for example, like all these things that are spiritual, or let's say out there in the ethers, through the energy of Aquarius, we can bring these things into our conscious awareness. And that's why when we are talking about entering the age of Aquarius, like the first step of entering the age of Aquarius was actually the invention of internet. Because the shift from one age into the other doesn't just happen in one year or in like just like that from one day to the other. It actually takes a while for the shift to take place, obviously. And so the shift already started in the 60s when there was a rise of interest in spirituality, when a lot of the Indian yogic teachings, they were brought to the West. And we are also seeing the flower power, like this revolution and this freedom, freedom of speech or people in general wanting to be more free. That's also an energy of Aquarius, this wanting to be free, wanting to have many options, wanting to explore all the different nuances. And then after that, obviously, with the invention of the Internet, which was in the 80s, 90s, when it then started to become open for the public, that's where then we started to become even more connected. And this connectedness, this bringing together of people, and this exploring of the mystery and the exploring of the spirituality, all of these are Aquarian themes. So this shifting of the ages, it's actually very real because we can actually see it, how it influences the way society functions or the way the themes that are coming up or the, the things that we are exploring. So one of the main keys or one of the most important things of understanding this archetype of Aquarius is again having the waters, holding that potential, but also this idea of networking and this spiritual web that is connected with the water and the air. So now let's look into, actually no, here, I'm gonna be using some of these uh, tarot cards. So we are channeling messages from Aquarius. What messages are there for the collective from Aquarius, the water bearer? What is the water bearer wanting to let us know? Okay, the cards are like funny today. There we go. Yes. We have the seven of pentacles. Okay. Three of pentacles. The lovers. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, beautiful, okay. And we have the Eon, okay. The message is quite clear. So Aquarius, again, is talking about this idea of the enlightened human being. So here we have Horus and we have Nut. So this is basically also Hathor. So Nut or the divine feminine that is arching over the, the arch of the sky, basically. The, the vault of heaven, the infinite expanse of stars. We are a star in this infinite expanse of stars. And this infinite expanse is Nut or Hathor. That's why the symbol of Hathor is also the Omega. Very often we see the depictions of Hathor with this Omega symbol. And the Omega symbol is actually also a symbol of the cauldron of the pot. So we, as the water bearer, have this whole cauldron in our hands, basically. Like we have the whole universe in our hands, basically, because we are connected to the whole universe, basically. And when we understand that we are a star in this infinite pot of ethereal waters, then we can actually start to work with this potential. So actually, spiritual enlightenment or reaching some level of spiritual awareness, or let's say climbing, starting the climb of the mountain, going towards the top, that's actually one of the crucial steps in order to fully embody all of the zodiac signs. Because if we are talking about embodying our highest potential, we obviously also want to embody all the other signs. So for example, I'm a Gemini, so Gemini traits, they are more common 
in the way I communicate, for example, or the way my makeup functions, like it's influenced by the energy of Gemini. But again, I also have the potential to be confident as a Leo or very precise like a Virgo or very emotional like a Cancer. And in order to then embody all these other aspects, we're actually needing to shift our perspective and almost see ourselves as the center, the star in the middle, that is basically where then everything revolves around. So all the 12 signs of the zodiac, they are revolving around the sun, the sun being Horus, the sun being Christ consciousness, the sun being ourselves, basically. We are the sun at the center of the universe. We are the witnessing consciousness. We are the top of the pyramid. We are that divine soul spark that experiences creation. And creation in this case is Nut or Hathor, the infinite expanse of life force energy, this infinite providing of love and sustenance and nurturing. When we see ourselves as a star in the womb of our cosmic mother, that means that we have shifted our perspective to the top of the pyramid, to the top of the mountain, this higher perspective. And that means that we can then start to embody more of our potential. So understanding the archetype of Aquarius, that's actually crucial for understanding enlightenment in a way. And it's very interesting that the previous age, the age of Pisces, during that age, we basically have been using predominantly Pisces, the energy of Pisces, in order to understand enlightened consciousness. But what the shadow of Pisces is, is this self-sacrificing energy with this seven of pentacles and feeding the energy of self-sacrifice. Also with this devil energy, like the distortions that dogma bring, has brought in, because during the age of Pisces, we actually have seen the rise of most of the world religions. Christianity was formed in that age. I'm pretty sure also um, Islam and uh, Judaism developed during that age. Also Buddhism, obviously. It all happened in that age. So through this rise of organized religion, or let's say more dogmatic religion, the shadow aspect of Pisces was sacrificing ourselves for the sake of following the truth or for the sake of following the dogma or following the status quo. But also looking at the light aspects of Pisces, this is talking about mysticism, about the mystery, and this is also the time where actually the ancient mysteries of pre-flood of Atlantean times, they were actually revived. But they were revived, like this energy of Pisces, we are talking about dreaming, exploring the invisible, exploring the unconscious, it's exactly this energy that has actually been suppressed. During the age of Pisces, we were more so operating still with this ego-based consciousness because we were still going through, let's say, the dark night of humanity or through the dark ages, like the medieval times, for example, they were the lowest point of consciousness. Like if you're aware of the yugas, here we are talking about the Kali Yuga, the lowest expression of consciousness. So since we were in this low of consciousness, in the age of Pisces, predominantly we have been embodying the shadow of Pisces instead of, let's say, the more positive aspects, which would be exploring the mystery, exploring the invisible. The exploring of the invisible still happened, but at the same time there was a persecution because during that time, during the age of Pisces, the forces in power did not want to did not want humans to embody this fullest potential. So that's why this dogmatic religion was actually an attempt to undermine our potential or to limit our potential or again, sacrificing our beliefs in order to fit into a mold or in to fit into society or to blindly follow what someone says without first thinking about, first thinking about it or first making up our own ideas about it. And so this is what we're letting go now. This is what is being released, basically. And so now we are moving into this phase, actually with the Eon, beautiful. We're entering into the Eon of Horus. 
the Eon of Horus, the Age of Aquarius. And in this age, we are actually embodying much more of this androgynous energy. Because during the age of Pisces, basically, we were more so in this patriarchal energy that was created with this dogmatic religion, basically. And the feminine aspect, the feminine aspect of exploring the infinite expanse, exploring the invisible, exploring the mystery, that has been demonized. And this demonization of Nut or Hathor, or the infinite expanse of the mystery, the demonization of divine feminine energy, basically, this has caused an imbalance in the human consciousness, basically, in the way we perceive ourselves and in general, also imbalance in the earth plane, like the way we perceive ourselves and the world, obviously also has an influence on the whole collective, on the whole realm. But right now, since we are moving into the age of Aquarius or the Eon of Horus, how it, how it is also called, we are embodying a much more balanced way with the lovers. This androgynous energy is knowing that we have both divine feminine and divine masculine within ourselves. Because what has created this toxic patriarchy or this imbalance is actually, again, this demonization of the feminine, but also this hyper-focusing on gender roles, for example. And this can then lead to imbalances in the way how we think of ourselves. This can also lead to, in general, not being balanced within our being, because we are both divine feminine and divine masculine. But if we shun a part of ourselves, if we shun the feminine in that case, that means we shun our invisible side, the spiritual side, everything that's beyond the material. If we don't, if we neglect that part of ourselves, basically, then we are not whole. Then we are feeling like something is missing. And this leads then to depression or illnesses or whatever. So in order to bring that balance back, since we have gone through a long, 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 long time of focusing on the material, of focusing on the masculine, focusing on the ego and the physical. Now, in order to bring that balance back, we almost have to not hyper-focus or focus a little bit more on the invisible, a little bit more on the feminine, in order to balance out this toxic masculinity. So... That's why right now we are talking so much about spirituality. We're talking so much about extraterrestrials and lucid dreaming, astral travel, all of these things, they are very Aquarian themes. And so since we focus collectively on this energy, this is what allows us to then bring the balance back and to then embody both energies. Because again, as the androgynous archetype basically the archetype of Aquarius is the most androgynous archetype of them all because it is really talking about the merging of the two forces into one or having this higher perspective actually with the birth energy, with Horus energy, having the higher perspective where we are then not caught up in the duality but we embody the duality in a balanced way and that's why we can move to this higher perspective of reaching the top of the pyramid, of looking at our life through the lens of the soul, through the lens of Horus, through the lens of enlightened consciousness. So it's really this perception shift, perspective shift, from seeing ourselves as a human to seeing ourselves as a soul in a human vessel. That's a completely different thing, because seeing ourselves as a soul in a human vessel, that allows us to then explore the invisible aspects of who we are. Because we are not only here, the human in the physical, but we are also all these other aspects, the Ba, the soul body, the astral body, the Ka, which is the causal body, the waveform body, that, that's actually the, the Ka, the, the waveform, our spiritual body, let's say, that appears in a serpent form, that appears in this waveform. And this waveform, that's the symbol of, Aquarius, the hieroglyph of water in Egyptian, in ancient Egyptian. So it's through this water or through this awareness that we are actually the invisible infinite expanse of water that we can then start to embody more of this feminine energy but in a balanced way. 
And it is really also talking about this idea of the Trinity. So here we have the Hebrew letter Shin. Shin also means spirit, but it has these three little signs here. And these three little signs, they're actually basically the divine feminine, the divine masculine, and the neutral point in the middle. Or another way of looking at it, this can also be sulfur, salt, and mercury, the three alchemical principles, or the three cauldrons, or the three, three in general, three is the number of creation, the, the number of the whole of creation. And by understanding the Trinity, by understanding our potential, and also in, to some degree understanding that we are androgynous, that as a soul, as an infinite soul, we are the point in the middle that can express itself in degrees of feminine and masculine. So again, we both, we all have both sides within ourselves, but surely one side can be more dominant than the other. But we're still wanting to allow both sides to express themselves and to be seen. This does not only have to do with like femininity, as in like being girly, but being embodied in our feminine actually means to connect to the invisible, to not only focus on the material, which would be the masculine, but also to connect to the immaterial, which is the feminine. So this is really this balance of the two forces. It has nothing to do with femininity or masculinity per se, but it is talking about the visible and the invisible. And in order to fully embody this archetype of Aquarius, we are wanting to see ourselves as the neutral point in the middle, as the androgynous point in the middle, that is the top of the pyramid, that is the top of the mountain, which is then experiencing the duality of creation. And then again, this duality is what creates this wave form. And this wave form, again, is the waters or the life force energy of infinite potential that can be turned into anything that we can use to create. So we can take our own jug, our own vessel, our own pot or cauldron and take the waters from there in order to create. But we are the neutral point in the middle. We are the top of the pyramid, the soul, the witnessing consciousness, which decides how this wave form is being expressed. We are giving it shape, basically. We are giving it we are giving it form. And this exploration of how to give form to the potential or how to actualize our potential, this is actually also the energy of the magician. Because we as magicians, we as the enlightened conscious creators, we are the ones who are directing energy. It is again really talking about the exploration of our potential. Because here we have the cosmic egg and we have the cosmic egg twice with the serpent around it, understanding that the serpent, the wave form, the zigzag of the Aquarius symbol, this is what allows the egg to be formed in the first place. And then once it hatches, to come out as the number three, as feminine, masculine, and the point in the middle. And when we understand this whole process of the Holy Trinity, of the cosmic egg and the waters, then we are actually getting closer to this embodiment of Christ consciousness, of not only the archetype of Aquarius, but enlightened consciousness in general. And in this age, since we are in the age of Aquarius, it's through the archetype of Aquarius that we are actually understanding this enlightened consciousness. Obviously, we can understand enlightened consciousness through all the zodiac signs, with Gemini, for example, or Taurus, but that's like one ray or one aspect of looking at oneness. And again, we want to have all the aspects. We want to understand oneness through the lens of all the 12 zodiac signs. But again, since we are in the age of Aquarius, collectively, the way we now understand this archetype of enlightened consciousness the most, or the way it is being, yeah, or the way it is coming through, is with this Horus energy, this Aquarius energy. So that's why I feel it's so important to explore the archetypes in general, not just the archetype of Aquarius, but all the archetypes, because they all hold a key that helps us connect with that divine spark, connect with the point in the middle, which is the soul, the Horus, the 
awakened Christ. So this was your message for today. I really hope you resonated with the messages. Please let me know if you did. And I'm also offering personal readings. So you may always reach out to me on my email address if you feel called to connect and collaborate. And also please don't forget to check out Linda's reading. You again find all the links in my description box. So thanks so much for watching again and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye, much love. Hello, pal number two. So this is your reading if you have chosen the one. So again, we are channeling messages from Aquarius, the water bearer. So we have seen in pal number one, if you come from there and if not, it's also fine. Basically, Aquarius is talking about this notion of holding the waters because, of course, it's the water bearer. And these waters, they're actually the infinite potential of creation. So basically, when we say we are the water bearer, it actually means we hold the infinite potential of creation in our hands. And quite literally, because it is through our hands, through taking the magic wand, taking action, initiating things, that we are creating the universe. Oh my God, and now a message is coming through about the idea or the notion of having 10 fingers, because it is through our hands that we create. Literally, when we create a painting, we do it with our hands. Or if we take the magic wand, we do it with the hand. <laughs> but there is this notion of actually having 10 fingers and 10 together is the number one. So that's why we have 10 fingers, because actually we are the one. Actually, we are source creator, but it is almost source creator within the number five. It's almost as if source creator, that is infinite oneness, would go into literally a glove <laughs> and the glove that this infinite light of love, of source consciousness, the glove that this light is slipping into is our human vessel. And with the number five, this is talking about the four elements and the fifth in the middle. That's why we have five fingers on one hand but it's the five of the cosmos mirrored with the five of the physics, of the matter. So spirit and matter coming together, the above coming together with the below. And that's why, again, we have the five fingers on each hand, but in total it's ten fingers. And ten together makes the number one. So this vessel is actually here to help us understand that we are the one, that we are the creator. And that's why every part of the body also has a correspondence with the planets, for example, or the teeth, they are connected to the organs and the nails and the bones and the geometry of our body. Like all of these are codes. And when we explore these codes, when we explore the correspondences, then we can actually understand our divine nature. When we ask the question, why do we actually have 10 fingers? What's the numerology around it and, and why five on one side, five on the other side? It could be six here and four here or whatever. So it's really talking about, again, this idea of correspondence, seeing the correspondences between the above and the below. And this is also a very Aquarian theme because Aquarius is also very... One of the energies of Aquarius is exploring like themes that are revolutionary so it's the things that are are out of the norm or like not taboo questions like that would be more scorpio energy but really asking the uncomfortable questions like asking who are we where do we come from asking about the mysteries of the universe and really yeah with these energies of the race exploring all the different race and basically these rays that are radiating out this is the waveform of Aquarius, like the symbol of Aquarius being the zigzag, this waveform of water, this waveform of light that actually can have an infinite expression. And we are again the ones who decide how this infinite potential of expression is being formed by using the power of our intent, by using the power of our word, by working with the five elements by working with the energies of the planets. Like it's really, the more we know about the nature of the universe, 
or the nature of ourselves, the more we can then actually maximize this potential. And instead of just being one ray, we explore all the different rays. Instead of just being, let's say, unlimited love or consciousness center, instead of just being this ball of white light, basically source is extending itself, exploring its potential by going into different vessels. And these vessels can then be either a human being or a spirit or an animal or a planet or a galaxy, whatever. There are different layers to it, different hierarchies and different nuances. Again, it's the exploration of the different rays, the different dimensions. And that's why Aquarius is also this multidimensional energy and this energy of exploring the space, exploring the mystery, like going out into the world in order to explore and get to know about things. Like Aquarius is very curious. They want to learn. They want to interact with humans. They want to exchange ideas. It's, that's why Aquarius is also talking about community, about bringing people together in order to exchange ideas. And it's good to do so. It's actually very important for us to share our thoughts and share our beliefs, share our ideas. Because the more rays we have, the more different nuances and different perspectives that we have, the easier it is for us to then get closer to the truth. Because if we look at the one or at the truth or at consciousness or love or light or the divine or source or God, however you want to call it, if we look at it through one perspective only, then we only have that one perspective and then it's very limiting. But the more we open up, the more we are free to express our truth, freedom of speech, expressing our beliefs and coming together in groups to talk about our spiritual beliefs. And the more we do that, the more it's actually helping us to understand our divine nature, to understand oneness. And that's why one of the main themes of the age of Aquarius is also freedom of speech and allowing ourselves to be seen, even if we are not really fitting into the norm. Because this forcefully needing to fit into the norm or fitting into society or into a mold, that's basically the shadow of Pisces. This is the collective trauma that we're letting go of, the trauma of being silenced, the trauma of being persecuted because of our beliefs, or the trauma of being persecuted just for being ourselves or exploring our potential with all the witch trials and all the, the um, Cathars and the Night Templars and all these things that happened, that, uh, so, so much persecution basically. Sorry, I just needed to turn on the light, otherwise it gets too dark. But yeah, now is the time to turn on the light. Now we are in the age of Aquarius and now we are actually welcome to explore all these different ideas. And it is actually crucial to have different ideas to explore all the unique viewpoints, like we no longer have to all fit into a mold. We no longer have to think all the same. We actually want to have a unique way of looking at things. We want to have unique perspectives. And that's why we want to embrace differences in viewpoints, like we don't have to all think the same way. And I personally really don't like if someone tells me what I should think. For example, if I channel information, then that information comes through for a very specific reason. And if you don't resonate with that truth, that's not my problem. <laughs> like this revolutionary aspect or this rebel aspect, it's actually source asking us to be a rebel with our own truth. To really say, yes, this is what I said and I will not change my belief, even if you disagree with what I have to say. Because maybe from my unique perspective, this is actually something that can enrich the whole collective instead of just blindly following what everyone else is saying. So that's why if someone is sharing a truth that maybe is a little bit out there or is out of the norm, this is actually invited, like Source wants it. Source wants us to have different opinions, different ways of looking at things. Because again, the more broad our perspectives are, the more unique and the more variety we bring in, the easier it is to understand the center. Imagine everyone would follow the same spiritual path. It would be so boring. If everyone would think the same, if everyone thinks the same, then we are not able to explore our fullest potential. 
And that's why if someone comes in with a revolutionary idea, with a very Aquarian idea that is very out there, instead of attacking them and telling them this is not truth or I see it differently, just allowing ourselves to be open, open to new ideas, open to new concepts, instead of rejecting new ideas and saying this is not truth or this is not making sense in my way of perceiving life. Like we want to be open to different ways of perceiving life. And that can only happen by openly listening to other people without having preconceived notions. Or again, it's really this energy, it comes up in all the readings that I've been doing, this idea of emptying our mind. Because maybe the truth is something completely different. It's not what one person is saying or the other person is saying, but it might be something completely out of the norm. And that's why the more empty we are, the more we free our mind from preconceived notions, the closer we can actually get to the truth. Because it is really about being open to new ways of perceiving, new ways of perceiving life, of perceiving ourselves, and just having new beliefs in general, like things that we maybe never thought about. But since someone is sharing it, and it's like, yeah, it's bringing in this fresh energy, like a breath of fresh air. We want to bring in fresh perspectives and not attacking each other for differences in opinions. That's not what we're here for. We're not here to fight over different opinions, but we are here to embrace each other's opinions. Even if we don't agree, we can still be friends. Even if one person doesn't believe in spirit and the other person is super spiritual, we can still sit at a table and communicate or we no longer have to force other people to believe what we are believing in. We can just share our truth and letting it be like a flower that is blooming. Because if we share our truth, then it's like a flower that is blooming. And if someone comes here and says, well, this flower should have a different color or this flower should open at a different time, like that's just unnatural. We want to express our truth, how it comes natural to us even if it's different to what someone else is saying. And this is the age of Aquarius, embracing differences, embracing our uniqueness, embracing new ideas and welcoming them, being open for them, listening to our community, listening to the other people, listening to the stories of our ancestors, listening to what people have to say and being comfortable with that, not shying away from showing our truth, not shying away from really speaking up and sharing our beliefs, because even if they might be completely out there, there is one person who will resonate with that truth. And there is one person who needs that specific code that you have unlocked for them by sharing your truth. And that's why, yeah, again, it's talking about freedom again, freedom of speech, freedom, freedom in general, freedom to be ourselves without having the fear of being persecuted or without having the fear of being misunderstood or even attacked by our peers because it is time to let the magic shine so let's see what we have all right we have the night right flower spirit the moon and to the moon and back oh beautiful and moon dance okay so basically with the elephant this is very much, and with the owl, that's beautiful. Like elephant and owl, for me personally, is always a symbol of wisdom. So the owl being the embodiment of wisdom, because it's this idea of the two wings of taking flight, but also the two polarities of masculine and feminine. So the vibration, when the owl is flapping their wings, let's say, when the wings of the waters are vibrating, this is actually wisdom. Wisdom in the sense of experience. Because without vibration, without motion, without the owl flapping the two wings that are creating the pulse of vibration, without that, there is no experience. There is no wisdom. There is nothing to gain, let's say. Because without the duality, there is only the one. There is only oneness. But now we talk about moving from the one to the duality. And this is then what is the water bearer. So the elephant having this water in their rustle, do you say? I don't know if, what, if it, how it's called in English, but 
they basically shoot out water from the nose <laughs> and basically this is this idea of using the waters of the infinite potential and again it is being splashed out through us so we are the elephant who are grounded with the four legs into this understanding because four is the number of grounding but also of understanding of the experience of space and time like the four cardinal directions the four elements and the fifth in the middle like the four is this being grounded in our truth being grounded in wisdom and then the water that comes out that splashes out that's like our experience that's like the water of the water bearer and this water is then what allows us to speak to create to yeah experience life so it is actually also through the voice through the voice through vibration through sound through motion through wisdom through experience this is what carries let's say the oneness into the realm of creation into the universe of creation it's really this idea where there is this point this dot of light that is traveling on the sine wave of vibration this dot of oneness this soul consciousness which is then being carried yeah on the waters of the ocean and it's very interesting that here we start with the one and here we have four and six which together makes up ten so this is really talking about the different ways of how to look at source the different ways on how to under, like how to understand oneness basically because if we understand oneness from this perspective then we see oneness as love as unity as singularity consciousness the supreme consciousness the supreme soul the universal soul but we can also look at oneness as the flower of consciousness as the enlightened human being with the number 10 the number 10 is the number of horus the number 10 is the number of the enlightened human being because we have gone through the whole journey starting from the one going through all the numbers and then we end up with the 10 but since there is it's 10 we then go back to the one so 10 is talking about christ consciousness 10 is talking about horus 10 is the embodiment of that divine light the embodiment of the universal soul while still being in a vessel and when we understand that when we have this understanding that we are the one that we are love that we are consciousness that we are the top of the mountain the top of the pyramid while still being in this vessel this is then what allows this flowering to take place the flowering of consciousness the opening of our crown chakra the thousand petaled lotus how it is called in the vedic uh, tradition in sanskrit language so this flowering of our crown chakra the opening of our flower the opening of the lotus flower is really this journey from let's say the darkness of the unmanifest through the whole journey of all the numbers first the number four then the number five six and then all the aspects of creation all the different fragments but then in the end we go back to the ten we go back to merging we go back to merging the divine and the human the above and the below the masculine and the feminine and we come back to the one and this is what it means to awaken spiritually and this is what it means to embody this aquarius archetype the archetype of the enlightened human it's actually also talking about horus horus krishna or jesus christ but it's interesting because in this age we understand jesus or christ consciousness through the lens of aquarius instead of through the lens of pisces so it's really really very much talking about the importance of perspective shifts and also these differences in perspectives again like having yeah being very open it is really talking about this openness and obviously this openness this expansion really because it's not just the center it's not just the one but it's this infinite expansion and more than anything the infinite exploration of this expansion and this is wisdom like we want to explore the different race taste the different flavors and see the different colors in order to really understand the potential of the divine 
because if the divine would only be this single ball of white light, then it's very nice, everything is there, everything that can be created and is all contained within one, but it's again like a ball of white light. So source creates this differentiation by exploding into like all these fractalizations, these infinite fractals of consciousness. But all of this is here to then again explore the potential and then in the end of the day go back to the number 10 again and understanding that we are the one. And then eventually we can merge back with that oneness. Pardon me, I had to stop the recording, but here I am. So yeah, basically the main message that we want to take away from this pile and also one of the main things that we need to know in order to understand the archetype of Aquarius is actually seeing ourselves as the one, seeing ourselves as the soul, the universal soul, the witnessing consciousness, love, unity, singularity that is entering the vessel of wisdom here with the elephant and the owl. We are basically this oneness that enters the vessel of duality, that duality of feminine and masculine, of above and below, that's then creating the form, the wave form. The, so it's basically the wave that creates the wave of vibration, the wave of sound, the wave of experience, of movement from A to B, or the evolution from one state to the other state. Basically, this is the vessel. And this is the pot or the vase or the, or the container that the water bearer is holding. So basically we are, the water bearer is actually the divine in human form. The divine not only being the vessel, but also holding the vessel. And only in this duality, only in this up and down of above and below and of this waveform, only in this space, we are able to have this flowering moment. And the way we can dance, the moon dance, or the way we can embody this unity consciousness while still being in a vessel, it's basically happening by understanding the workings of the vessel, understanding what the vessel actually is, understanding the vessel of our human body, but also understanding the vessel of the universe and then understanding how both relate and not just understanding, but also like having a lived experience of that. Because only if we embody the divine light, only if we have a lived experience that we are the oneness of love, of singularity, of unity, of consciousness, only that allows this flower to bloom. And this is this higher perspective. This is this Horus perspective. So Horus is also one of the archetypes connected with Aquarius. Again, Horus being the enlightened human being. So Horus being the falcon is flying in the spiritual skies. And from this heightened perspective, Horus can look at the life from both sides. So by flying to this highest perspective, and the highest perspective that we can have is the one. The highest perspective is this oneness, singularity, love, consciousness, however we want to call it. It's about connecting to that spark, to that perspective, but then also taking that perspective and grounding it into the vessel. So that we can experience the vessel while being untouched. Wherein Horus is taking flight and we are able to look at ourselves through the perspective of the higher self. And this is what allows us to dance the moon dance. This was your message for today. I really hope you resonated with the messages. Please let me know if you did. And also please remember to watch the Dark Alchemist's channel to see part two of this reading. And I'm also offering personal readings. So if you would like to connect and collaborate, you find all the information on my website below. And thank you so much for watching again. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye. Much love. Hello, pal number three. 
So this is your reading if you have chosen the tier. And again, today we are channeling messages from Aquarius, the water bearer. And actually, before I look into this card, I'm feeling called to pull some oracle cards to see what messages there are from Aquarius for us. Or in general, any guidance that helps us connect with Aquarius, the Aquarius archetype, and also to connect with that energy, like to embody that energy, to flow with the shift. All right, one more. There we go. Oh, okay. Beautiful energy. We have the key on trees. Then we have my dear friend. Oh, I love word games. <laughs> That's always nice. My dear friend, um, like a bird and red garden. I'm actually strongly being taken to this story of the tears of Isis. So what the tears of Isis are, this is basically the mourning of Isis. So Isis is weeping or crying because her husband Osiris has died. And Osiris, that's basically our higher self. So Osiris being the king of the underworld, this is actually talking about the, the aspect of our higher self that lives in the invisible realm, that lives in the underworld. Hence, Osiris being the king of the underworld. So when Isis is weeping, this actually is talking about the human experience. Because when we, as the higher self, the higher self being unity consciousness, oneness consciousness or love, when we as the higher self are being incarnated into this human vessel, then for a period of time or for however long, we will feel a sense of disconnection to this oneness. Now this is from pile number one, but I still take it here because it's, it feels like a continuation. So the weeping of Isis, which is by the way also the weeping of Mother Mary, so when Jesus dies, then Mother Mary is weeping. This weeping is basically talking about, yeah, it's actually the, the human, it's talking about the human story. So Isis is weeping or Mary is weeping because she is not feeling the presence of Osiris. So this is talking about the time when we are, let's say, in suffering when we feel like something is missing or we don't have this connect, the connection to our higher self, this is then creating sorrow. And this weeping, this is actually what allows us to have wisdom in the first place. Because the weeping of Isis is not only Isis mourning about the death of Osiris, but it's also talking about the sorrow of humans in general. This sorrow, like this is talking about this melancholy energy or saudade. <laughs> we are incarnating into this vessel, almost knowing that on some level we will be caged or on some level we will be limited. And this is actually talking about the tower because here I'm seeing the tower. So it's almost like we build up a tower based on false beliefs because incarnating in this realm, we are basically forgetting that we are the one for a brief period of time or for however long. And that's why since we come into this life, not knowing that we are the higher self, not knowing that we are the one, we basically start building our sense of self and our identity based on our programming or based on the environment or based on whatever. And so we start building this tower, but then at some point we will feel or see that this tower is limiting. Because when we start to go beyond the physical, when we start to go beyond the, the human, our human self, then we will at some point remember our oneness. We will at some point reconnect with our spiritual nature. And once we have done that, then undoubtedly or without avoiding it this tower has to fall because the tower again is this building up of let's say a distorted sense of self 
And so this distorted sense of self, whenever we are in this distorted sense of self, or whenever we are, let's say, disconnected, disconnected from our higher self, and I do the, this one because we are never really disconnected from oneness, we are never really disconnected from our higher self, but surely we might perceive that we are disconnected because of the tower that we have been building. And so this mourning of Isis or the crying, this feeling of not being connected to our higher self, this is actually the only thing which allows us to have wisdom in the first place. Because if we were only always in the oneness, consciousness, if we were this ball of light, then we could not have an experience of going from A to B or evolving from one state into the next. And that's why we cannot have to have this illusion of separation. We kind of have to perceive ourselves as being separate from source to some degree in order to have any experience. Because otherwise we could not have any experience. Otherwise we would be the dot in the middle, the center in the middle, which is our essence, which is our higher self. And obviously our higher self is always there. Our higher self doesn't go or doesn't change. It, it doesn't matter what happens in our life. It doesn't matter what happens in creation or to our human self. It can never touch the eternal nature of the one. It can never touch the infiniteness, the infinite, the infinite light of the oneness, basically. And that's why we have to forget that we are the one in order to have an experience. And this forgetting about our higher self is Isis mourning the death of Osiris or Mary weeping because Jesus has died. And Jesus dying is the dying of unity consciousness or the dying, the dying of the awareness that we are the one, that we are our higher self. And the main message that is actually wanting to come through with the tear it's about seeing this perceived separation from source not as something negative or something painful that we have to cry for but it's actually seeing the potential of growth seeing it as the potential for evolution seeing it as a potential to learn something to grow to expand and then obviously at the same time knowing that no matter what happens in our life or no matter what happens on this earth plane or in the universe at large, it can never ever change the nature of the one. It can ne no, Nothing in duality or in creation can have an influence on the one because the one is the one and that doesn't change. If we add something to the one, then it becomes two. But the two is not the one. The two is the duality. That's a different realm. So if we are operating from this realm of oneness, if we're operating from this state of awareness that we are the one, while still being in the vessel, then we can have a much smoother experience of life. And then this crying or the weeping doesn't feel like suffering, but it's actually, we can alchemize it into seeing it as something creative, seeing it as an opportunity for growth. And this is then actually when the tear starts crystallizing and it is turning into gold. Beautiful. There is even the story in Norse mythology about uh, Freya, Freya who is also weeping. So we see the same story in all the traditions, Freya weeping golden tears, Isis mourning for the death of Osiris, Mother Mary crying because of the death of Jesus Christ and I'm sure there are many other stories. I'm not sure about Shiva and Shakti, but I'm sure that there is similar messages or similar stories there as well. So in order to alchemize this pain or this suffering of perceived separation, we basically have to connect with this bird aspect, with this Horus aspect. Again, the archetype of Aquarius talks about Horus, about this higher self embodiment. When we take flight, and look at our life from a different perspective, from the highest perspective actually, from this oneness perspective, then this tear is turning into gold, or this tear is crystallizing, and basically this is the alchemical gold. 
And the thing is, we can only find the alchemical gold if, let's say, the tear is there. Or if, let's say, this perceived separation from oneness is there. Because if we are talking about this realm here, there is only one. And it's so hard to, I, I'm trying to find the word, but there is only one. There is only light. There is all-knowing, all-power, omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience. Everything is contained, like the whole universe and beyond, is contained in this one single dot of singularity. And this one single dot of singularity, that's the soul, that's love, that's consciousness. And there is only one. There is only one soul. There is only one consciousness. There is only one. <laughs> what else can be said about the one? It's one. So the one is the one and the one doesn't change. Even if there is two, even if there is light and dark, good and bad, evil or whatever, we are still the one that is the soul and that doesn't change. And so when we then go through this perceived separation, when we go through this experience of forgetting that we are the higher self, only then we can then reconnect with the higher self but in a completely new way, where if we would stay in the one, then it would only be a potential to become something. But then here with the tear turning into gold, this is then this transformation. And then what we do when we come back to the one is coming back, but with wisdom, with experience, with evolution, with, we, we can then take something from it and then feed it back into it. So one of the main keys to understand the archetype of Aquarius is actually again by understanding this notion of the higher self. But not only the higher self as the oneness, but also the higher self embodied in the vessel. This is higher self embodiment, like this is actually Horus. Horus having the double crown, the red crown of the physical realm, and the white crown of the invisible realm. So the white crown, that's the same crown of Osiris. That's the crown of the higher self. So basically when the bird, when Horus is wearing both crowns, then it means that Horus has mastered both the invisible realm, but also the physical realm. Because Horus having the double crown is the king of both, the king of the above and the below the king of the spirit and the matter. And the king of the spirit, the king of the underworld, that's Osiris, the father of Horus. So our father, our cosmic father, that's basically this ungendered oneness. So we cannot really say father, like the, the soul surely has masculine aspects because it's this ray of light, it's this spark of activity but the one is still ungendered. So everything that comes out of the one, like this spark, this light, this ray of light, that's more resonating with the masculine energy. So Osiris being the king of the underworld, Osiris being basically, yeah, that's the higher self aspect that will always stay invisible, that will always stay in the spiritual realm. But then if we look at Horus being the king of the red land, the king of the desert, the king of the material physical realm, this is then, what this actually means is that Horus has embodied this divine spark, has embodied the knowingness that he is Osiris, and then brings it back to the physical realm. So it's this integration of our oneness. It's the integration of our higher self. And this is basically what the archetype of Aquarius is talking about. Aquarius is the archetype of the enlightened human. And this is the same archetype or a similar archetype like Jesus, Krishna or Horus. And it is quite interesting to see that the bird is basically looking here at the red land. Because looking at this card, I'm really strongly being taken to this energy of seduction, femme fatale. Oh, wow, beautiful. It even says here, the art of seduction. So basically, everything that is happening in the red land, the desert, so the physical realm, the material realm, that is basically like almost seducing our soul. Because 
what we find in the desert, what we find in the physical realm, are sensual pleasures. So this is talking about the sensual pleasures, everything that has to do with enjoying food and sexuality and emotions and all of that. So these sensual pleasures, they're almost trying to seduce our soul so that we remain in this cycle of reincarnation or so that we remain in the cycle of death and rebirth, of always staying in the universe of creation, staying in the space-time of creation. And this is, by the way, not only Earth, but also higher dimensions. Everything that's material, everything that's somehow tangible or like crystalline, everything that has a crystal form. And so the mastery is actually about looking beyond that, looking beyond the sensual pleasures, looking beyond everything that we perceive as good or bad, or everything, everything that has sense in general. And that's why the closest we can get to our true nature is actually by connecting to the silence, by connecting to that blackness. And that's why also Osiris is called the master of the perfect black. And by the way, not only Osiris, but also Krishna. Krishna is also called the Black Lord. And this black refers to the blackness of the void, the blackness of silence. So in order to connect with that higher aspect of ourselves, in order to revive Osiris, or in order to revive Jesus, or in order to bring Krishna back, we basically have to look beyond the sensual pleasures of the physical realm, and being able to connect with that silence. It's actually about going beyond the zigzag wave of Aquarius, that is the water that is in motion, and actually connecting to that space of being static, being stable, being still. It's a very interesting. All these words, they start with ST. Stillness, stability, stable. So it's really about finding this stillness point in the middle this unity consciousness basically and this can only be found if we are stealing the waves stealing the waves of vibration stealing the waves of noise the waves are vibration our thoughts are vibration our thoughts are a wave every every shape has a wave so it's really about transcending the wave actually going into the silence and this is then what allows us to have the alchemical gold to embody our higher self and this is very much what the archetype of Aquarius is talking about. It's talking about higher self embodiment. And when we have embodied our higher self, then we literally become like a bird. Very beautiful. So when we are a bird, then we can fly beyond the Red Garden. Because this is also talking about Horus and Set. Horus is the king of the sky and Set is the king of the desert. So Set is our lower nature, that's the ego nature. The ego nature that is attached to the sensual pleasures of the physical realm. And if we are Set, that means we have four legs and we are grounded on the floor. So as the lower self, as the animalistic self, let's say, we only have the perspective of the physical realm. But as soon as we embody our Horus nature, as soon as we embody our bird nature, then we are able to move beyond the desert, move beyond the physical, and fly into the skies of the astral realm, where we can then connect with the invisible aspects of our being. And this taking flight, this shift of perspective, moving beyond the physical and into the spiritual and the immaterial, this is actually the process of growing our antlers, very beautiful, or growing wings in general, like our wings or the antlers that are growing is basically this awareness that is expanding and it's allowing, basically it's allowing our awareness to expand beyond the physical. Because here again we have the four legs of being grounded in the physical. But since here the antlers grow, it's this expansion of awareness beyond the physical and into the immaterial, into the spiritual. And the more these branches grow, the more far out we expand, 
the more our awareness also expands. And if we expand it all the way to the edge of the universe, then at some point we will end up with the one. And when we have connected this human self with the one through the antlers, then we are the embodied higher self. Then we have embodied our higher self. And it's very beautiful because now the message is coming through. And I also hear this for the first time that these antlers that are growing, this is actually the network that I was talking about in pile number one. If you come from pile number one, the energy of Aquarius is very much talking about this network. I have mentioned it there. It's basically the water, the water particles inside the air that connect the whole network of spirit. So the antlers, they actually allow us to grow. This wave form of the zigzag of up and down, like the waters, they allow us to grow. And through the waters of Aquarius, through these spirit waters, we are then able to pick up on everything that's going on in the universe. Because the more our antlers grow, the more these branches extend out into the universe, the more we are able to pick up the nuances. Then, then we can start channeling higher dimensional beings or connecting with certain deities or connecting with certain, yeah, connecting basically with all the invisible aspects of who we are. So growing our antlers is actually what allows us to basically communicate through the quantum field. So the zigzag of Aquarius, like the zigzag symbol of Aquarius, this is actually talking about the quantum field because it's this zigzag of waveform that is basically creating the whole network of the whole universe, of all of creation. So the antlers, they obviously exist ethereally. So by growing these ethereal antlers, we basically grow or raise our awareness, expand our aura, and thus we are able to channel information from the Akashic records, for example, or healing through the quantum field. Like this is then when we, where we can start doing things like remote healing, for example. Also, when I do a healing session, the reason why I can do healing sessions remotely is because we are still connected through the quantum field. And if we know that this connection is there, regardless if the person is standing in front of me or on the other side of the world, then we can still connect with each other. So it's about understanding also that no matter how far we go, through the antlers, through this quantum field, through the waveform of vibration, we are literally connected to the whole universe. And that's why the teachings of the Tree of Life can really support us, not only in embodying this Aquarius energy, but in general to align with this shift. And the shift is what is happening basically collectively, is we are collectively embodying our higher self. This is what this great awakening is about. So that not only, only one person is enlightened, but the whole collective is enlightened. And that's why the teachings of the Tree of Life, they are re-emerging now. Because it's through the teachings of the Tree of Life that we understand how all the realms are connected. That we understand how the branches can grow. So the branches of the Tree of Life are the antlers that are growing. And these branches or these antlers, they're basically how everything is connected through the quantum field. And again, when we know how the whole tree works, then we are able to connect to specific energies and frequencies. And that's why Aquarius is also talking about multidimensionality. It's talking about lucid dreaming and astral traveling, like all these things. They're only possible if we are growing our antlers, if we are aware that we are the whole tree of life. And in order to understand that, obviously, we have to study the tree of life to some degree. But not only that, like we don't really have to spend a whole lifetime of studying the tree of life. It's also studying nature, like observing nature. That's also, like, that's also studying the tree of life. It's basically observing how everything is related because it's really about observing the streams on the floor or the streams that are created through rivers 
and seeing how they are similar to the streams of our veins, for example. This is also studying the tree of life because the tree of life is basically how everything is connected. And Horus, being the bird, is the bird atop of the tree of life. Horus is the oneness consciousness that from the top observes the whole tree. And while also being inside the tree, because Horus can fly very high, but Horus can also be on the floor. Horus can go into this dimension or in the other dimension. Like Horus having the double crown, it means we are masters of both realms. So we are still here, incarnated in the physical, mastering the physical, but we're also mastering the higher self. We're also able to fly through the skies of the astral realm. And what allows us to fly through the skies of the astral realm is growing our antlers, growing the branches of the tree by understanding that we are the whole tree, by understanding that we basically are the oneness consciousness from where the whole tree then emerges. And this emerging of the three, the three as in the number three, but also the tree as in the tree of life, this emerging of the tree of life is the emergence of creation, the emergence of all the different rays, all the different colors, all the infinite fractalizations of creation. And this is then these branches that are basically, yeah, it's like a thunder that is like fractalizing out infinitely. But in the end of the day, no matter how far out we go, no matter how many fractalizations or everything, in the end, we always come back to the one. And that's why the main focus is actually about going inwards. It's not about going out or trying to look for the answers anywhere outside of ourselves. It's actually about tuning within and going to the core, basically. Because when we are connected to the core, then we see that we are the tree trunk. Then we see that we are here in the middle. And from here, the branches grow, the antlers grow. Not only the antlers, but also the roots, the underworld and everything. But if we see ourselves as like a little branch or like a little twig here, like a little thingy in the physical realm, then we only have like this very limited perspective where we are like a little thing on this little branch here. But again, it's this changing of perspective from being this little branch in the physical realm to actually being the whole freaking tree. <laughs> so that's a really big uh, perspective shift. And this is basically what is happening collectively. And the energy of Aquarius can really help us embody our higher self, embody this knowingness that we are the whole tree of life. So this was your message for today. I really hope you resonated with the messages. Please let me know if you did. And I'm also offering personal readings, so you find all the information on my website below. And also please don't forget to check out the second part of this reading on Dark Alchemist, on the Dark Alchemist uh, channel. And thank you so much also Linda for collaborating with me. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in again. And I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye, much love.